Good morning. What a beautiful day. A little too cold. Man. Anyway, if you have your Bibles, let's open it to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, as we continue studying some of the fruit of the Spirit. If you have a few Bible, it's on page 1132. 1132. This is God's word. So it's Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your holy word. May it speak to us this morning as we look at joy, the fruit of the Spirit. So speak to us, Lord, through your holy word. And we'll thank you for your teaching this morning. And we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So looking at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, where Paul speaks about the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, in your life and in my life. Listen as I read once again what Paul says in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, as you look at that text, you realize that the very first fruit that Paul mentions is love. And we realize that we live in a world that talks a lot about and glorifies the subject of love. You know, but too often, real love is missing. And as a result, people are looking for love where? In all the wrong places. So the church needs to become a beacon and an oasis of love in a love-starved world, which I believe I see more and more today. Now, the next, if you look at the text, the next fruit of the Spirit that Paul mentioned is joy. And I ask you, do you have that joy that God mentions? Do you? It's obvious that many people don't. And you've been around them, haven't you? That don't show any joy or not God's joy. I mean, they're grumps. They're gripers. They're very negative about virtually everything that happens in life. They're complaining most of the time. And as a result, they just aren't much fun to be around, are they? You know a few of them? You know, one of my favorite stories about a person with a grumpy personality begins with a man going to a doctor's office. As he walked in, he was met by a receptionist. And he told her that he had a sore on his chin and wanted the doctor to examine it. She said to him this, down the hall, first door on the right, take off your clothes. But ma'am, he said, it's just a sore on my chin. I don't think all that is necessary. And she repeated, down the hall, first door on the right, take off your clothes. But ma'am, he said, down the hall, first door on the right, take off your clothes. So he went down the hall, took the first door on the right, walked in and saw another man already sitting there in his boxer shorts. Shivering. He said to him, boy, that reception is really something, isn't she? I just had a little sore on my chin, and she told me to come down here, go through the store, and take off my clothes. And the man in the boxer shorts said, you think that's bad? I'm the UPS delivery man. I mean, there are some difficult people, aren't there? And what they need is a personality transplant, I believe. So let me give you a definition of joy. You ready? Joy is the evidence of the presence of God in your life. If God is in your life, is he? If God is in your life, 
If you are filled with the Spirit of God, then this fruit of the Spirit will be obvious in your life. And it should be. Now, don't mistake happiness for joy. So many people do that. It's easy to do that. See, the Bible mentions joy or rejoicing 330 times, but only mentions happiness 26 times. See, happiness depends upon what happens to you. So if all the circumstances are right, then you can be happy. But remember this, joy comes from the inside. Joy comes from the inside. This morning we're going to identify some enemies of joy. Then we'll look at a perfect example of joy. And finally consider the question, how do we experience that kind of joy? So what are some of the enemies of joy? Sometimes we're robbed of joy by the different differences between generations. There have always been generation gaps, haven't there? There still is today. But it seems to me that generation gaps are more obvious now than they've ever been before when I look around. Now, I can't use myself as an example because I came from a defunctional family, as most of you might know. So my childhood memories are not the same as most others. But listen to what a friend of mine remembers about his childhood. He said, I grew up in a home overshadowed by worry. Our country had come through the World War and a depression, and now we're engaged in a second World War. My father was busy working two eight-hour shifts at a factory, building heavy equipment to help our boys win the war. My uncle was in the Marine Corps, and we talked in hushed tones, wondering if he would return home ever again. There wasn't much laughter in our house, but when you went to church, but when you went to church, that was a pretty sober time, too, in church. I mean, I look around all the time at you people <laughs> every Sunday to see what kind of looks are on your face. You guys are kind of sober sometimes, <laughs> a lot. Anyway, there was a lot of reverence and prayer, deep concern, but not a lot of laughter. Not a lot of laughter. And those of us who are older grew up in that kind of environment. When we were in Florida this past week, we went to a small church that has grown to five, 600 people. And I, knowing this message I want to speak about, I noticed the laughter in that church. Why is that? Why is that? I noticed that laughter. But I believe time has changed. And if you just look at circumstances, you would think that we would be the happiest people in the world, wouldn't you? I mean, think of that. Because we're richer than any other generation, and our quality of life is better than ever before. We ought to be extremely happy. We're not, but we ought to be. Times are different. And the younger generation sees church as a place to rejoice. I was sharing that too. I went to this church. The young people, they were rejoicing, raising their hands, praising the Lord, jumping up and down. And I looked around for age group, and when they got older, they're sitting there, sober. See, young people want to sing peppy songs. They want to clap their hands, while most older folks want to be more solemn, more restrained. Now, really, when I think of it, that, neither is wrong, really. Neither is completely right. But it's wrong when we cause dissension and banish joy because of our different points of view. A sec second enemy of joy is unresolved guilt. A lot of people are unable to accept themselves and to accept the forgiveness of God. I hear many people say, God will never forgive me for that. Hmm. I mean, you may have come through a divorce and you feel that you're inferior in the sight of God. Or you may have had a bad brush with the law and you feel that 
you're not welcome in God's house anymore. Or that people would not understand if they knew the secrets of your life. I mean, you think about it. David was the same way in the Old Testament, wasn't he? He had committed adultery. And he felt enormous guilt over it. He wrestled day and night with that guilt. And finally came to God in Psalm 51, verse 2, and prayed, Restore, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Have you prayed that? And the third enemy might be a wounded ego. You know, a lot of us walk around with our feelings exposed, just waiting for someone to say the wrong thing <laughs> and, and not say anything at all. And it happens. People don't always act the way we would like. They don't always say the right things. Sometimes people, even the church, offend us. And our feelings are hurt. Then we feel unloved and unneeded and left out. Then the fourth enemy of joy is unpleasant circumstances. All of us, I think, begin life with unrealistic expectations as to what life is going to be like. I know I started out thinking, well, I'll marry the perfect woman. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and I did. And guess what? And we'll have perfect children. And we do. And that we live in a perfect house and make lots of money, which we haven't. <laughs> and we would be wondrously happy all of our lives. And there would never, ever be any problems. You know what? But problems come. And they come to everybody. I mean, you may lose your job. Your children may disappoint you. There may be heartaches. Your health may break. Problems do come. But here's the good news, folks. Here's the good news. Even though the circumstances are unpleasant, God still wants to give you joy. Huh? To exchange who you are. He wants to change who you are if you don't have that joy in the way you think. So secondly, let's look at the perfect example of joy found in John chapter 15, verses 5 through 11. If you want to turn that in the Bible, it's John chapter 15, verses 5 through 11. And see what we can learn from it. But first, listen as I set the stage for you with this text. The night before the crucifixion of Jesus, he is in the upper room with his apostles. Soon he will be going to Gethsemane. Soon he will be arrested and tried and convicted of crimes he did not even commit. Soon they will be laughing at him. They will put a crown on thorns on his head and mock him, calling him the king of the Jews. They'll slap him and spit on him and whip him with a cat of nine tails. Soon his body will be nailed to a cross and he will die. And he knows that all of this is going to happen. It's not a joyful time, is it, for him? But listen if the text you've opened here. Listen to what he says in John chapter 15, verses 8 through 10 of the text. Here's what it says. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Now listen to verse 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So on the last night of his life, facing the cross, Jesus talks about Love and joy. And the next day, he goes to the cross and he dies for us. Think of that. 
the writer of Hebrews looks back at that and writes these words in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. What powerful words of God. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, the joy set before him endured the cross and scorned its shame. Now, can there be any joy in a cross? Can there? I hope before the sermon is over, we'll understand how that can be true. So listen carefully now as we consider the question, how can we experience that kind of joy? How can we? See, I believe, first of all, we need to develop and maintain personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So where does it begin? Jesus Christ. Listen to what Jesus says in the chapter John 15, verses 5 and 6. Here's what he said. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown in the fire and burned. So Jesus is saying, listen to this, Jesus is saying, that when we become Christians, okay, we're like a branch. If you're a born-again Christian, you're like a branch attached to the vine. Who is the vine? I can't hear you. Jesus is the vine. That's who you're attached to. And we're what? We're the branches. As long as we're attached to him, we'll bear fruit. But if you're not attached to them, folks, you don't have any fruit like that. So that is where it begins. When we are attached to the vine, it means that we have accepted Jesus as our Savior. And if you're here this morning and not a Christian, then you need to become one. No wonder some of us look so sad in the world, huh? You can never have the joy that this pastor talks about until you are attached to Jesus. You can't. If you're a Christian and there isn't much joy in your life, then you need to be reattached to that vine because you're separated now. One of my concerns about the church is that there are detached branches that are dying. I believe there's some right in this church that are dying. And that they don't even realize it yet. They look alive, they sound like they're alive, but in reality they're dead. Because they're no longer attached to what? Divine Jesus Christ. So you need to be reattached. And there are some basic things that you have to do to make that happen in your life. So first of all, you need to read the Word. Who wrote this book? Someone tell me. Oh, you didn't write it? God wrote this book? Is it his word? Does he give us promises? Does he lie? No. You need to read the word of God. You can know what God's will is and what God wants you. Until you read his word, you're not going to know that. So read the word of God and spend time in prayer and seek his will for your life. You also need to attend church. (laughs) I was riding down here and I'm saying to myself, I go past a sign. Hey, turkey shoot today. Where does the hunting and fishing guy go? Turkey shoot. What does the Bible say? You need to attend church. That's pretty basic, I know. But there are people who think you can be a good Christian and not even attend any church. And I disagree. You know why? Because we need each other. Christian brothers, we need each other. We truly do. We just can't make it by ourselves. Until you're rejoicing in the fellowship of other believers, 
Until you're spending time with brothers and sisters in Christ, you'll never have a firm attachment to the vine. Who's the vine? Man. Hmm. So come to church. See, learn from one another and grow with one another. And the joy, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. I listened to two men speak at the NACC in Indianapolis. And one is Bob Stacy, and the other is Leroy Larson. Both of these men have lost grown children in the last few years. Bob Stacy's daughter died because of a brain tumor. Leroy Larson's son took his own life. Both of them told of their grief. They never for a moment tried to disguise the tears which are still fresh on their cheeks or the brokenness they felt inside or the pain they're going through or the grief. But in spite of all that, you could hear their voices, the evidence of God in their voices and the joy that was there. That's all you can hear from them then. They had joy. See, Peter explains that in a wonderful way. In the fourth chapter of 1 Peter, he says in verse 12 and 13, he says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange was happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the suffering of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So I tell you, right now, things may be tough for you. But one of these days, we'll see the glory of God and we'll be overjoyed because of it. And secondly, we need to give ourselves in service for others. I'll say that again. See, we need to give ourselves in service for others. One of the biggest problems in our world today is that we have become so self-centered people. Have you noticed that? That we no longer experience the joy, the joy of serving others. Do you want to know why the writer Hebrew says he endured the cross, scorned the shame because of the joy that was set before him? Do you want to know why the cross was an object of joy for Jesus? It was. Here's why, because he didn't do it for himself, did he? No. He did it for us, for you, for me. He went to the cross for us, yes. And there's joy even at a cross when you're doing it for someone else. So, hey, so call up someone who's lonely. Go visit a nursing home. Visit someone, mow someone's grass or shovel their snow who can't do it themselves. Write people a note. Give some money away. Become less focused on yourself, on yourself, and more focused on others. Jesus said, if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you give it away, then you'll find it. Then you'll find it. And thirdly, focus on the eternal and not the temporal. See, the reason Jesus could endure the cross is because after the cross came what? The resurrection. Amen? Yes. As we go through experience of life, we need to see that one day we're going to be a glorious resurrection when we will be with Jesus too. Oh, if that doesn't bring you joy, woo, what does? See, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18, I'll read it to you. Paul writes this. Therefore, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we waste away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us 
and eternal glory that far outweighed them all. So we fix our eyes not on what we is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, right? But what is unseen is eternal. Here, I tell you something. Everybody got mirrors home? Look in the mirror, and you'll see yourself wasting away. All right, do it. Look at your material possessions, and you'll see them wearing out, right? The whole world is winding down. I mean, think about it. Everything is wasting away, isn't it? But inwardly, but inwardly, we're being renewed every day. So don't look at the things you can see. Look at the things you can't see, because they'll last forever. How many people here can see heaven? No. Is it going to last forever? Yes. See, my greatest joy as a father and a grandfather is to see my children and grandchildren laughing together, enjoying each other's company. See, my greatest concern as a father and a grandfather is when my children and my grandchildren bicker and don't get along with each other. See, if that's true with me, isn't it also true with God? See, his greatest joy is when his children love each other, rejoice together, laugh together, enjoy each other's company, and his greatest sadness is when we don't get along. And all the joy is gone. No, I'm not going to that church and see what she said to me. Sound familiar? See, the fruit of the Spirit is love in, expressed in joy, in joy. It's the evidence of God's presence in your life. I think it's so much fun when people are laughing and having joy of the Lord in their heart life. I do. So if you're here this morning and you're really not a Christian, I invite you to come to Jesus. See, remember, Jesus must come first. Establish that relationship in Jesus Christ. Develop it and then maintain it. And boy, will you have joy. I think about that often. God keeps reminding me that I need to keep that joy of the Lord in my heart and share it with others. That's what joy is about. It's fun. I'm a nut as it is, as you can tell. I mean, I have fun. I like to see people laughing and full of joy. And, and then they'll, even during their joy, they'll say, you know, I have this joy because Jesus is my Lord and Savior. That brings me more joy. You know, I'm not, hey, praise the Lord, I'll raise my hands. Even the old man I am, the oldest one here. He gives me that joy. Without that joy, we're not on the vine, right? Who's the vine? Jesus Christ. You're not really with him. Th my prayer is that you think about that, look in the mirror, and when you look in the mirror this time, you see this joy of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. May we be reminded each day this is your holy word written for us. And it is so wonderful to have the gift of joy, to be on a vine, Jesus Christ to walk around a smile. There's nothing better, Lord, than someone come up to you. How come you always laugh and smile? Because I have the joy of the Lord living in my life. May you have the same one. And I pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.